Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carol Rawls, and I'm glad to have this chance to share with you. I was glad to hear about this program when we moved here a year ago, and um, I'm glad to have a chance to share this afternoon. And the book that I picked, or it picked me, was uh, Roger Morgan Grenville's book, Shearwater. And it's part memoir and part nature writing. And um, the subtitle is A Bird, an Ocean, and a Long Way Home. And since I was going to be staying close to home this summer, for the most part, this book appealed to me when I saw it on the summer reading table at our branch library. So I'm going to um, be reading to you from the, the opening chapter of the book, which tells the beginning of his story and his relationship with this special bird. And the author, Grenville, is a, has been a soldier, an explorer, He's a founding member of a conservation charity, and the previous title, he has five books, and the previous title was Liquid Gold, Bees, and the Pursuit of Midlife Honey. So if you're interested in beekeeping, that might be appealing. But this particular bird, 10 weeks into its life, a Manx shearwater chick will emerge from its burrow and fly entirely alone 8,000 miles from the west coast of the British Isles, it seems impossible, to the South Atlantic, and it will be unlikely to touch land again for four years. So that's just a little bit. If we have time, I have a little, he, he did a Shearwaters, uh, the Idiot's Guide to Shearwaters, which I'll share at the end. But this part today is telling the story or beginning the story of his relationship with his grandmother and her influence on him, which those of us with young people in our lives, we like to think that we have some particle of influence. So she certainly did. So chapter one, the 83rd bird, 1971, the Isle of Mull. There is no such thing as the pursuit of happiness, but there is the discovery of joy. Joyce Grenfell. In the summer of 1971, Tuesdays were our puffin days. Puffins were the natural history offerings of my childhood summers, on which it had been almost impossible to overindulge. Puffins were bird-watching, made manifestly and childishly joyful, a pound of comic sweetness with sad clown eyes, Charlie Chaplin walk, an outsized, colorful bill. Back then, when there was little talk of global warming, of struggling sand eel populations, or of decline, my sister and I had an uncomplicated fascination with a creature that seemed more burlesque than seabird and whose mannerisms somehow made us exquisitely happy. We spent the middle part of each summer at my grandmother's little Hebridean croft on the southern tip of the Isle of Mull, and at least once or twice on each holiday, she would get Callum, the boatman, to take us over to the waters around Staffa to find them. Other children may have had more obviously exotic holidays, but our trips to Mull were the integral hard landscaping in the garden of our young summers. The expression, work hard, play hard, 
could have been invented for these days where mornings might be pulling ragwort from the stony field beyond the garden wall, a penny paid for proof of a dozen roots, carting sacks of seaweed up the rocky path to pile on the vegetables, cutting tracks through the bracken in the hilly wood behind the house. But the payback for those mornings of work was the uncompromised availability of my grandmother for afternoon adventures, bundling along to favored beaches to swim with the seals, climbing hills and settling in for tea with her eccentric widow friends scattered around the island. Often these wanderings took us to the neighboring holy island of Iona, where we would endlessly harvest the sea-smoothed white and green marble pebbles on St. Columbo's Bay, pebbles which even now sit on my terrace outside my Sussex kitchen door. The tacit deal was that we understood our place in the pecking order after the dogs and before the birds, and that we did our full share of the chores. She was more gang leader than grandparent. As relentless at galvanizing activity as she was a calm evening listener to childhood and teenage problems, into the mix came a variety of bizarre activities that would now have any adventure training center closed down on the spot, chainsawing logs without protection at the age of 14 comes to mind. But we ate well, we exercised massively, and we slept like happy corpses when the day was done. Those early summers of a life etch into memory their unforgettable colors, the blue hills beyond the Bunessen, the speckled pink of the granite rock, and the black-brown squelching ooze of the bog. And always the permanent but ever-changing presence of the surrounding sea and its raucous birds Selective memory insists that it was just about always sunny, which it wasn't, and that there weren't really midges, but there were. Sea and shorebirds together with the relentless wind, that was the soundtrack of our times there, and it started on our very doorstep. The four-note monotone tutting of the resident great black-backed gulls, Laurel and Hardy, as they sat patiently on the cottage roof when nothing was happening, followed by their yelping long calls when they spotted their food. As children, there was nothing that we weren't prepared to feed them when nobody else was looking. And as gulls, there was nothing they would refuse. Gulls can live for over 25 years, so they eventually became as much a fixture of the place as my grandmother, or Robin at the petrol pump, and we would politely ask after them in our letters as if they were family. Out on the marshes between Loch Kale and Market Bay, we would hear the trill of oyster catchers and the mew of the hunting buzzards. On the cliffs, it would be the high notes of the golden eagle. And then over on the evening, the sea locks, the, the maniacal cry of the single great northern diver. Best of all was the simultaneously life-enhancing and mournful call of the curlew an expression of wilderness joy, or maybe an elegy for
for extensions, extinctions yet to come. Little by little, and without my ever knowing it, the sounds embedded themselves in part of my soul that I was still too young to comprehend or to access at will. Generally, my parents would leave us and her to it, perhaps understanding that the safety valve effect of a period of separation in a long summer school holiday. This meant that the adventure started with the allocation of the unaccompanied minor badge on the flight up from London and only ended when my parents arrived for the last week of our stay. It was not that we didn't do adventures with them. It was just they were different ones with different rules and hierarchies. Mull simply gave my sister, my cousins, and me the chance to go feral for a short period of time. And feral is what children do most naturally if machinery and adults don't get to them first. Chicken paste sandwiches in greaseproof paper, apples and penguin biscuits were our staple diet for, for days out, chased down by whatever cordial my grandmother had recently made. Sometimes she would take along cans of tenants lager to share with Callum, or whoever we were spending the day with. Depending on how she felt, she might let one of us drive her Land Rover the three miles to the Fanon Fort Pier while she was in the passenger seat playing Clementine on her mouth organ that she kept wrapped in a bandana in the glove compartment. For a boy whose coltish legs hardly reached the pedals, this illegal preface to the Puffin Day was so good as to be a tiny glimpse into the very backyard of heaven. The deal on both sides that my father was never to know what we had got up to while we were staying with her. It'll be the Puffins you'll be wanting to see again, I suppose, Callum would sigh as we decanted ourselves and our kit from the pier onto his fishing boat. I'd say you're leaving it a wee bit late this year. It was his mournful catchphrase, and he probably would say it whenever we had come, and no matter what we wanted to go see. Whatever Callum had been put on earth for, it was not as a bringer of joy. The essential problem was that schools down south where we lived did not break up well into July, by which time most of the pelagic birds which we were looking for were starting to head back out to sea. The best of the watching is gone by then, and what remains is down to luck and the prevailing weather. I helped Callum cast off from the rusty iron ring on the pier, pleased to be publicly useful in such a physically undemanding way. The familiar smell of Callum's boat, a mixture of diesel oil and rope tar and old fish, managed to be both thrilling and nauseating. And we were grateful that he chose to head up the tiny bull hole channel rather than straight out to sea. It extended our shelter for another 10 minutes and delayed possible seasickness. That wouldn't hit us until we passed the tiny white village of Kintra. The open sea was no stranger's thing even to us who saw it so rarely. It was a huge part of why we were here. The ring of bright water that surrounded our island and our own vast private swimming pool. Twice a day, it covered the sands that we ran on. And when it retreated, its fading water revealed the mussels and shrimp 
and sea anemones that kept us engaged after salt-encrusted hours. We grazed ourselves on its rocks as we slipped on the thick carpets of its ochre bladder rack seaweed. It was the provider of mystery for us, for into it dived the laundry white gannets, and out of it, if you were lucky, came mackerel and crabs to eat, and otters to gaze upon, and seals to swim with. The mood of the sea defined the day and the land we ran across. Journeys like the one we were on today supplemented the ferry crossing and the local fishing we did on other days. I sat up in the prow of the boat while the two adults exchanged news of local infidelities, and my sister chatted away with the friend that she had brought to Mull for the holiday. I had a tiny notebook diary with a stubby pencil stuck into its spine for making notes of what I saw. The trick was to identify whatever I could for myself before having to ask Callum for his help. That was the last resort. I have that little book still, the embryonic evidence that even then I was captive to numbers. My looping schoolboy hieroglyphics set out the order in which I saw the different birds that late July Tuesday of my life. Great black back gull, parentheses, lots, herring gull, ditto, arctic tern, curlew, gannet times four, and so it went on. Ever so often the line would, would go off the paper when we had hit a wave. I had a list of 82 birds at the time, mostly seen in and around my parents' garden in Sussex. So these trips were pregnant with possibility of new additions. Such research as I was capable of here, namely a visiting birder from Holland whom I had met briefly in the village store the previous day, had suggested I might just get a black guillemot. He said, so there were two for me two days since. Forty minutes later, we were nearing the dark and vertical mass of Staffa, its symmetrical bulk softening into its true natural irregularity as we approached. That was the precise moment I saw it for the first time. I can still remember my grandmother's voice in the background telling Callum about something that had happened in Morocco earlier that week, a coup, and Callum, whose horizons stretched no further than the sea around the Ross of Mull, saying enigmatically, aye, well, that will be the way folks do it down there. At first, I thought it might be a gull or a fulmar as it raced towards me, but no, it was flying through the air in the wrong way and far too fast. It seemed to be more in the sea than above it. Three quick wing beats and a glide. Three quick wing beats and a glide. Jinking this way and that way, and always with one wing tip seeming to touch the waves. As I drew closer, I saw the torpedo-shaped body, the thin sickle wings, the white underside, and the dark top. When it passed directly behind the boat and the end feathers of its right wing appeared to brush the very wave itself, I knew for certain I had never seen this bird before. I knew nothing of it, and for a fleeting second it had shone a beam of light 
into the world of wildness for me. I followed it around the stern of the boat, suddenly panicked that I would lose sight of it before I knew what it was and missed the opportunity of a rarity. Callum, I shouted, what is that? That's a shearwater, he said slowly, once he had turned around. She'll be a manx shearwater, puffin' us, puffin' us. He might not know what was happening in Morocco, but he knew the Latin name for every bird around his islands. She's a big wanderer, you know, one of the biggest of them all. Over the years, I had come to realize that all of Callum's birds were she's. I came back to sit next to him by the tiller. What do they, I couldn't think of the right word, what do they do? While he spoke, there were more shearwaters passing the back of his boat, heading back to some new fishery with a sense of purpose that seemed to elude the other seabirds. What do they do, he repeated. I suppose they just fly and fly till there's no more ocean to fly over. These ones here will only be around for a few weeks, and then next stop, the Atlantic, the South Atlantic. South Atlantic, I parroted in my astonishment, but that's across the equator. It had never, excuse me, it had never occurred to me that birds crossed the equator, a line that to my young brain was still somehow a physical one, let alone traversed half the globe. It is, he said quietly, but I suppose they don't really go there because I don't think they ever land there. They won't land until they get back here. He nodded toward the brooding bulk of Staffa next spring. And piece by piece, there on a near calm inland sea, he laid down for me the mosaic of the sheer water's world. He was in his element, and so was I. Exaggerations there may have been, but for me, he knew how to fire a boy up. That's where your bird goes when she's not here, he finished. That's why she's always been my favorite. She's the size and weight of a little wood pigeon, you know, but she'll travel the world. I'm pleased to see the others, right enough, but she's the one who makes my heart sing. Well, the prospect of this normally taciturn man's heart singing was one that intrigued me. I squinted southwards into the noonday glare and saw another shearwater and then another one and then no more. Your bird, that's what Callum had called it, my very own bird. Little in my life dates back to an identifiable moment in time. Most of who I eventually became is the product of genetics and the thousand mundane developments that took place each hour of each day of my young life. So it is for all of us. But when that last shearwater beat its way across the wind, up toward its raft, and then its nighttime burrow among the wave-blasted, wind-sculpted revetiments of Lunga, when the thoughts of Callum the boatman turned as they had from the workaday week to the heroic then, a switch had been thrown within me. From that moment on, the wilderness enticed me. No headland failed to summon me around it. No unclimbed hill allowed me to walk easily away. For introducing me, 
to a wildest not controllable by humans, bird number 83 trumped all the others. All the sparrows, the chaffinches, the gulls, the hooded crows that were part of Sussex were to a large extent predictable, but not with the shearwater. That birds that would emerge from and recede back into their wild ocean home. On reflection, there was nothing unusual in this. My grandmother's trick was to let the wild glories of her world present themselves to you according to their own natural rhythm and not to the dictates of any human plan. If that sheer water happened to have spoken to me, it had done so very much on its own terms. And that's the end of the beginning. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It was 35 years later before he saw another shearwater. And when he did, he decided that he, it was on a vacation with his wife, and he decided that he was going to spend the next year tracing the migration of the shearwater, which he did. And this is, I'll, I'll read just one little thing he said. He said, as he, when he saw the shearwaters, he was on this ferry. And he says, as I watched them, it struck me forcefully that I didn't want to just park my enthusiasm when the ferry docked in Maleg to start again only when I happened to come this way. Sure, I could learn all there was to know from books and videos and academic papers, but I would know the Shearwaters no better if I did. Against the backdrop of sky coolins and the sound of sleet, I started to articulate a foolish promise to myself. The promise was that I would follow these birds wherever they took me for the coming year, for one cycle of their lives. In that time, I would learn all I could and allow myself to be changed or not by whatever I learned. So there you go. <laughs>